My name is Joseph Anthony Hoschild. Last name is spelled H A U S C H I L D. And I'm incarcerated in the Virginia Department of Corrections. My inmate state number is 1617860. I'm currently 39 years old and I've been incarcerated since I was 17. At the age of 17, I was a juvenile and had a very rough upbringing. Uh, I'm from the Chicago area, moved all around the Chicago area, had a single mother, a uh, stepfather. My biological father was never involved in my life. Uh, my mother had some mental issues she dealt with. My stepfather was very abusive. Um, Growing up, I had a lot of things to deal with as far as trying to fit in because we moved probably every year, trying to fit in in the school system. Uh, and it was hard, you know, it was really hard to gain friends or gain any type of... Uh, my stepfather used to beat on my mother, call her derogatory names, uh, beat on me. Uh, and it was hard to deal with that as a child growing up. So dealing with all these issues that, that um, a child's trying to deal with, um, and at the same time being abused, and at the same time uh, not having that motherly love or, or fatherly love or, or guidance, you know, when we, we look at our parents we look at people who are supposed to take care of us. And as children, we have to look up to our parents, literally, because we're so small. But when you see that everything that is coming from um, what is supposed to be nurturing or guidance or authority is, is abuse, you start to internalize that and, and realize that, okay, this is how society works that people abuse each other and there isn't nurturing or there isn't loving and you internalize this to believe, okay, this is how other families are or this is how our institutions are, this is how our government is. And growing up, especially around the, uh, the, the Chicago area, you have a lot of crime, you have a lot of gangs, you have a lot of things that are going on that um, obviously are criminal. And I turn to hanging out with these wrong crowds, hanging out in the streets, um, selling drugs, smoking marijuana every day, uh, getting in fights, getting suspended from school, arguing with teachers, all the things that, that adolescents do when they're not given proper guidance and it ended up to the point where I was at an all-time low and I was 14 years old and I swallowed half a bottle of Tylenol to try to commit suicide oh. and I woke up in the middle of the night and I'm throwing up everywhere and I, I go to tell my mom and you know she's like man go back to sleep mm -hmm. and then the next morning uh, she's so furious with me and she tells me, you know, next time you want to kill yourself, go jump in front of a fucking train. This way I don't have to deal with you. Oh, and it's just man. these, these things for, for a kid to, to try to deal with, uh, it really leads you to believe that, that there's nothing really there for you, especially at this time, you know, my, my mother and stepfather, they divorced when I was eight but I bounce back between uh, them. But that leads you to hanging with your peers even more and, and, and smoking even more uh, marijuana and, and using even more drugs to tr try to numb the pain of, of not having anything. And uh, so in, in my later teenage years, you know, 14, 15, 16, I started getting in more fights and more trouble. And it... Uh, eventually landed me uh, 
at the age of 17 incarcerated for armed robbery. You have one minute remaining. Uh, so at the age of 17, uh, I find myself incarcerated for armed robbery, attempted murder, home invasion, aggravated battery, discharge of firearm, and criminal damage of property. And all of this happened in a single course of conduct. And and what that means is that it wasn't like an armed robbery happened this day and then a home invasion happened another day. It was this entire crime happened at the same time. And um, it happened in St. Charles, Illinois in August of 2001. And basically, me and my co-defendant, we knew one of my friends named Chris, and we used to hang out and, and smoke marijuana, smoke weed, and, and from time to time, you know, we were associated. And uh, he ended up committing suicide. Oh, and, man. Yeah. And uh, he was more from an affluent uh, community, uh, part of the community, and he always had money. And, you know, I asked him one time, I said, man, where are you getting all your money from? And he was like, well, my parents have a safe, and, and uh, I've been going in there, and, and I've been stealing money out of there. And I was like, well, do you want to, like, I could break in and, and, you know, we could try to steal the money. He was like, no. Nah. And so I left it alone. And at the age of 17, man, I, I'm, I'm not looking at it like, you know, one of my buddies is gone. I'm looking at it like, well, me and my other buddy, we could go and get this money now. Yeah. And we broke into the house and we had guns, and uh, we went in there just for the robbery. At no time did we intend to shoot anybody or, or anything like that. And I'm assuming, I don't know for a fact, I'm assuming uh, out of you know the parents' desperation, uh, he threw the safe at us and, and, and lunged at me and gunfire broke out. And we took the safe and we left. Okay. I didn't know I didn't know how many times he had been hit. If he had been hit, I had never even fired a gun in my entire life until that time. And uh I know I know I initially had fired my weapon and then I heard my co defendant fire his weapon. And uh, we ran out, and a week later, me and my co-defendant were arrested off of a uh, anonymous tip. So okay. In the county jail, I'm in there, and I'm 17, and I'm in there with guys who are 30, 35, 40 years old. And, you know, you got some guys in there. These guys are career criminals been in, in and out of prison. Uh, so as a 17-year-old white kid in a county jail surrounded around more people of color, uh, unless they were my peers and they grew up with me and knew me because I grew up around a lot of black and Latinos, these guys are looking at me like, yeah, here's, here's you know, this young white boy. And obviously I had to fight for uh, be a victim, and I was I refused to be jumped on or, or or beat up. And a couple Latino dudes, they they seen that you know I can handle myself pretty good, and I wasn't going to let guys rob me or, or or jump on me. They asked me if I wanted to uh, join join a Latino gang, and I was like, well, you know, man, let me think about it. And they told me, look, man, you, you got a big case because my case was all in the newspapers. They said, you're probably going to go to a prison. Uh, you should really think about, you know, what you're going to do because, you know, you could go to uh, prison and 
probably 85 percent of the prison system is ran by guys from chicago's street gangs from the 60s and 70s who've been structured organized and it's a lot it's a it, it's really a lot different um uh, as far as the county jail so i said man let me think about it man and then you know a few days later i thought about it and i was like look man all right cool uh because i don't want to be fighting guys for the rest of my life because i'm solo i'm by myself and uh after that i really didn't have any problems guys respected me and uh i was in the county jail for two years uh with my case i ended up getting found guilty and at my uh sentencing i apologized to the to the family for what i'd done no i didn't kill anybody nobody nobody was murdered uh and eventually i ended up getting uh sentenced to 67 years in prison which is your modern day death sentence death by incarceration uh my co-defendant he testified against me in order for a deal he testified against me and only got 12 years even though he was charged with the same crime i was 17 and he was 15 he got charged with the same exact crime. We were both juveniles. We were both under the age of 18. And they gave him a deal for 12 years just to testify against, against me. And my attorney, at the time, she brought up, she said, she said, Your Honor, you gave him a gift. This is a gift, 12 years. And then, and then my client gets 67, and she already, she I believe she did a good job as far as the disparity in the sentence that this is insane. Um, so I go into the prison system and uh, I'm 19 years old and I'm trying to figure it out. And it's, uh, I mean, they have studies out there that say that the mind isn't fully developed in an individual until they're 20, uh, 25 years old. Um, and the frontal lobe has process dealing with cognition and decision-making. And so for me being incarcerated since I was 17 and now being in prison where I'm at, ni- at 19, I'm still trying to figure out what's going on. And I'm in uh, Illinois in the Stateville Correctional Center. And uh, I end up getting in this big gang fight in, in 2004 in the child hall and at that time i was 20 and i get sent to the tams uh super maximum prison which was in uh tams illinois and it was 24 hours lockdown i mean the, the prison was crazy you had guys who were losing their minds there they they guys who were going mentally ill because long-term isolation takes such an effect on the brain if uh, you don't know what you're dealing with. And to point out how how insane it was is that the prison was built in 1998 and it only ever held around 300 prisoners in long-term isolation. And the prison closed in 2013. So for a prison that, that cost almost $80 million to build and was only open for 15 years kind of lets you know how bizarre it was um they lost a big case called west f versus snyder which dealt with uh long-term isolation why guys weren't being given hearings uh, uh real hearings of why they were being held there because usually when somebody commits an infraction in prison they would go to segregation for a, a determined amount of time. So you can get in a fight, maybe go to segregation for 30 days. Whereas here, in my case, I get in a fight and then I ended up being in TAMS for seven years. So while we're in TAMS, I've seen all these uh, guys who were dealing with, with their own problems of long-term isolation and it wasn't everyone uh, was going crazy. But every you could see the nuances and the things that took effect with guys because there's something called res which is a reduced environmental syndrome that's where you don't get that mental stimuli 
and the brain, the, the, the functions of the brain that deal with decision-making and whatnot start to slowly deteriorate. But while, while in TAMS, I started doing a lot of soul searching, a lot of studying, um, focusing on my education. I ended up earning my uh, high school diploma, which I graduated with a 4.0. Um, I ended up earning my uh, paralegal diploma and uh, I took various little uh, courses dealing with uh, rehabilitation, like uh, family clinical uh, services and uh, conflict resolution. Whatever programs that they did offer, I actually did take and, and try to internalize those things to better myself. But the one thing that really changed in me is I wanted to study history. And I feel that especially here in America, we don't have this connection to our past. Um, for a lot of people, we just see what is today, what is now, uh, trying to pay the bills, uh, consumerism, uh, capitalism, everything is about money. And for a lot of Americans, we lose that connection with our past. It, and not just our parents or our grandparents, we try and go back e even farther. And I wanted to know these things. And somebody who played a big part of my life was my grandmother. Um, my grandmother from the time of my incarceration until the time she passed, uh, she passed in February 2021. She was always there for me. She would write me letters. She, she would try to help out when she could. And I used to ask her a lot of questions uh, about my ancestors, where they come from, uh, the things that even my grandmother had to deal with because she grew up dur during the Depression. And she told me, she said, uh, after years and years of, you know, getting all this information, she told me, she said, Joseph, she said, you know more about me than, than anybody else in my family. And I said, well, that's good. And uh, she just started laughing about that. But I really wanted to learn history and the formation of America, our constitution, um, our laws, the things that affect us, the things that um, we probably don't even realize we have, freedom of speech and, and, and whatnot, just, you know, the, the First Amendment, being able, being able to even do this, uh, they created all these little isolation units throughout the prison system in, in, in Illinois. So they had little administrative detention units all throughout the state. And basically what an administrative detention unit is, is they put you in this area around other guys, probably 90% of the guys that were there were guys who had come from camps. And they put you in this area and that's it. You go outside once a week for five hours. Um, you get a shower once a week and you can use the phone call once a week. Other than that, you're in it yourself. You're, there's no going to the law library. If you need case law or anything like that, you have to request it. There's no going to religious services. There's there's no integration. There's no program. There's it, It's nothing. You're just sitting in the cell. So you, it was tams all over again. And I was like, man, this, there's only so much of this that, uh, that I could take because the state just lost this West Ever versus Snyder case. So it's like, okay, you're not following what the law says. The law says that you can't keep guys in long-term isolation. So they closed hands down, but create all these administrative detention units. So they basically curtailed the law and create all these little units so that guys would have to file numerous lawsuits throughout the state that uh, relitigate their issues. So. What I did was, this was in in um, the end of 2013, around November, December, uh, I asked guys, I said, look, man, there's only so much that we can take of this. I've known a lot of you guys from TAMS. We could go on a hunger strike because we're not going to get anything done. We're going to sit here and relitigate the, I mean, the, the, the West End versus Snyder case took 13 years to litigate. I said, man, we're going to be sitting back here 13 years filing lawsuits. We could go on a hunger strike. We can we can write different organizations, let them know what's going on, and uh, hopefully we'll get some support. So 
once guys, I explained to guys what our issues were and, and our only option was, uh, pretty much everyone back there, uh, you know, about a good 20, 30 guys were like, you know what, uh, Joe, because a lot of guys call me Joe, they said, man, yeah, let's go on the hunger strike because we're not going to get anything else else done. So I wrote some attorneys. I wrote uh, Jesse Jackson in the Rainbow Push Coalition. And uh, so I wrote uh, Jesse Jackson, Rainbow Push Coalition, some other grassroots organizations and told them that this is uh, uh, what we're going to do. One of the biggest helpers was Alice and Stalin Lynn out of Ohio. They're, they're two great attorneys uh, who said, uh, Mr. Hallshaw, we support you 100%. Uh, we're going to get in contact with some uh, different attorneys. We're going to put up a website. We're going to let people know what your issues were because our issues specifically was no due process, telling us why we were back there. Um, there was no heat in the winter. The heat didn't work at all. It was super cold in the cells, and they wouldn't give us extra blankets. Uh, they didn't give us jackets, so when we went outside in the wintertime, they, they because we only went outside one time a week for five hours and they wouldn't even give us jackets and it's snow out there. Um, they had rodents. It was rodent infestation. There's guys in here that are rehabilitated, but they, they, they haven't been given any other recourse. But when it, comes, when it comes to specifically going on this hunger strike, people in free society and in the Chicago area supported us in such a way that some people even went on hunger strikes and free society with us because they felt that we were being dehumanized with, with not having cleaning supplies and being locked down so long. So on January 15th of 2014, we all went on a hunger strike. People in free society organizations supported us um, Jesse Jackson even sent uh, um, two people from the Rainbow Push Coalition down there to uh, to interview guys and see what was going on. And, and I send all the respect in the world to Rainbow Push Coalition for, for coming down there to the prison, actually going through all the, the hurdles and, and loopholes to try to get in, all, everything that they do. The, uh, the roadblocks that the DOC tries to put up because at the end of the day these prison walls and prison gates aren't just here to keep guys in they're also here to keep the public out because they don't want the public to know what's going on within the, the, these prison systems so January 15th 2014 we go on this hunger strike Oh, they come up there, guns blazing. They come up there in their suits. The police are all dressed in suits. They're furious. They want to shake us down, rip our property up, um, and just basically harass us. Well, nobody feeds into it. They come up there. They're shaking cells down. It, it, they're, they're ripping through our property for no other reason because we're on a hunger strike. Um... I ended up going for 29 days on the hunger strike. I went from 210 pounds down to 169. Mm. Um, another guy, you know, there's two other guys. They were they were they were littler. They were smaller than me. And I, I tell you, uh, one guy he went for about 31, 32, and then another guy went for 34. But I wanted to set the standard because since this was my idea, since I organized everything, I wanted guys to know I'm going to go as long as I can because I can't take being in this administrative detention unit without knowing I gave it my all. And um, we had we actually had people who were, were in free society from uh, the St. Louis area because Menard is right there around St. Louis, right across from Mississippi. And they heard about the hunger strike, and they actually came to the prison, didn't come in, but were on the outside of the prison and were beating on drums and had banners, and they said, we support the hunger strike, and we could see them from our window. And uh, 
that was so awesome, man, to see these people take the time out of their day to come there and beat on drums and, and say they supported us and to j just show you how vindictive the, the, the prison system was. They actually came and put big metal sheets around our windows just so that we couldn't see out the windows anymore. Um, mm. But the warden, he pulled me out and uh, he said, well, Mr. Hallschild, uh, what state you want to go to? And I was like, man, anywhere but here, I'm ready to go. And he was like, all right. And you know, it was kind of an intimidation factor. It was the warden, the major, a couple lieutenants, a sergeant. And uh, they just wanted to let me know that they wanted me gone. And in April of 20, 2014, uh, U.S. Marshals came and got me. They sent me to O'Hare Airport in Chicago, Illinois. Got on a plane from O'Hare. We went to Cincinnati. Got on another plane from Cincinnati to Richmond, Virginia. And I've been in the custody of the Virginia Department of Corrections ever since. Okay. So, so in Virginia, the one thing that I noticed uh, right away was that they had more privileges. And when I say privileges, it's not just like they were just giving us stuff. Uh, I say privileges in the sense that they were actually putting in the time and effort for rehabilitative programs. There was a hundred times more rehabilitative programs in the Virginia Department of Corrections than there was in the Illinois Department of Corrections. Uh, and I signed up for everything I, I could sign up for. Um, I ended up becoming a, a, a basically a building worker where, you know, cleaned and sweat, mopped, uh, took care of the chemicals, make sure other guys were doing their job. Uh, that was in 2017. And then in, in after that, in 2017, I ended up becoming a, a, a gym worker. And working in the gym, really helped me with a lot of social skills because I was at the Sussex 2 prison in, in Virginia. And while there, you have 1,200 prisoners on the compound. And every week, I seen pretty much all 1,200 prisoners because throughout the week, all the prisoners, they would have a schedule so that certain buildings would come down during the week and I would pretty much see everybody. And guys would play basketball and, and, and sometimes there would be a conflict. And being a gym worker, um, our boss, they expect us to try to resolve a conflict so it doesn't turn into a fight. I mean, even though these guys aren't getting paid millions, I mean, you watch, you watch NBA, you see guys fighting on the basketball court. Guys who aren't getting paid at all, they have the same enthusiasm, enthusiasm and the same emotion, and a fight could break out over what they thought was a bad call or whatnot. So we had to learn, I had to learn, and, and the other gym workers who were there had also had to learn how to deal with these issues. Okay, come on, guys. You guys get in a fight, you're going to end gym recreation. You guys get in a fight, you're going to go to segregation. You guys get in a fight, you could probably get transferred to another prison. So it's, sometimes you see things are escalating. You got to intervene and be like, hey, guy, hey, come here, man. Let me holler at you. You know, calm down, man. Get a drink, water, relax. You know, there's always another game. Don't take it so harshly, you know. And uh, we also came into contact with a lot of guys who, who didn't have long prison sentences and who are going home in a short time. And some guys might be lost or confused or, or don't have anything to go home to. And I could be like, hey man, you know, you need to start thinking about some of these programs out there. You can get into a halfway house. Uh, you got religious groups out there and, and non-religious groups out there that are actually out there to help guys who are getting out of prison, to help them try to get jobs, help them to get on their feet. You know, don't sit there and think that you're going to just get out and go back to selling drugs or doing the same things that you were doing. Because if you do that, you're just going to come right back into prison. It's, it's not going to pay off 
and a lot of times guys guys would listen but you run into a few knuckleheads that, that are like they're going to do what they want to do and there's only so much that you could tell them yeah um but but during this time i was still doing my education um i ended up earning my uh, uh civil litigation uh certificate these are these are advanced paralegal certificates I actually earned a, a personal injury tort uh, paralegal certificate while I was on the hunger strike. I was still taking that course. Uh, even while not eating, I was still studying and, and still working to educate and better myself. Um, but then I ended up earning my civil litigation uh, uh, certificate. And here in Virginia, I ended up getting into uh, paint, painting and drywall a vocational course and I ended up graduating that with, with flying colors and, and the supervisor the teacher he was so impressed he asked me he was like Mr. Hallshaw would you like to have a job as a vocational teacher's aide and I said sure I, I would enjoy the opportunity so I ended up having my own computer and when I say computer there was no internet access at all it was just I had a computer which dealt with uh, creating files for prisoners. I had word process on there so that I can help guys type up their resumes and other little uh, things that they had to do for the class. And uh, I was a teacher's aide and had to help guys how to put up drywall, how to uh, put up the taping, how to uh, put up the mud, how to sand everything and make it smooth, how to put up, do the paint. And, uh, one of, my, one of my good friends, Anthony Gomez, uh, which I'm pretty sure you'll end up talking to, uh, me and him took the class at the same time, and it was pretty funny because um, it was the first time that he, he ever held a hammer in his hand and, and hit a nail. <laughs> mm. And it, it, it's, yeah, it's kind of funny to see a guy, you know, in his 40s who's never held a hammer in and He's sitting here trying to hammer in a nail into the wood, and I'm trying to explain to him, yeah, you, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna hit your finger off. He's worried about hitting his finger. But uh, I really, I really enjoyed uh, teaching guys and helping guys. And, and during this time, I actually had to take uh, pro literacy uh, tutors uh, aid class, teachers aid, which dealt with guys who had learning disabilities because you have a lot of guys in prison who have mental problems, learning disabilities, might be dyslexic. You could do the work. He just needed the encouragement. And I ended up getting my certificate for um, helping guys with learning dis disabilities, specifically being the teacher's aide to, to do that. And as time went on, uh, he, he wrote a very good... Um, um, comment on my work ethic with, which you have which is a, a part of my clemency packet and he basically said he said man this guy Mr. Hallschild even under some stressful conditions he always does the work he always puts in the effort and he said that he believes that I would be uh, good for the workforce which I really appreciate him. And I, I learned a lot from him because he was a very good teacher. And he, and he really, he was probably one of the only teachers I ran into that didn't look at us as inmates. And he refused to call us inmates. He called us students. He said this student or that student because he wanted guys to know you are a student and you are here to learn. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to point the finger at you because that's something a lot of correctional officers do is they say, hey, inmate, hey, inmate this. You know, it's the way they say it and how they say it be very derogatory for, for a lot of guys who are already in prison, already in a compromised uh, situation. So um, I ended up uh, getting going back to the gym because of my boss, he, uh, he ended up leaving, and there was a new boss back there, and he used to be a correction officer who turned into a gym supervisor. And he was like, hey, Mr. Hallschild, uh, I really need you. You know how to referee games. 
Uh, basketball games are one thing for, for a lot of people in free society. Basketball's real big in prison. And uh, guys that have tournaments and, and, and they really enjoy it and put the time and effort into actually uh, playing and trying to have, have a good tournament and good games. And so he said, hey, I need you to come come back here and help me referee, help help the other guys referee so we get these tournaments started. And I'm like, all right, cool, no problem. And, and I went back to the gym, and, and then COVID hit. And um, as everybody has lived through COVID, the, the entire planet had pretty much been shut down. <laughs> well, during COVID and, and, and being locked down, uh, I ended up being transferred to a, a lower security prison because of my good behavior and how I've conducted myself. And I was sent here to the Augusta Correctional Center, which I was just notified yesterday that's supposed to be closing by uh, July of 2024. But while here, um, I've been employed as a, a foreman, basically, you know, sweeping, mopping, buffing the floors. I've been employed as a painter because I already had my uh, my painting certificate, uh, graduation from vocational painting and drywall. I had my OSHA card, um, aerial lift. So basically I can get on a lift and go up 30 feet and clean the rafters and paint the rafters, the ceiling, what needs to be taken care of. And um, Kurt, You have one minute remaining. If anybody would like to get in contact with me um they can email me they would they would have to go to jpay.com that's j and then p-a-y.com and they would have to type in that i'm in i'm in the state of virginia and uh my name joseph hoschild h-a-u-s-c-h-i-l-d and my inmate state number is 1617860. Um, that would be the quickest way for uh, an email. If anybody would like to contact me through your regular U.S. post office, the same name, Joseph Hallschild, 1617860. And that would be Augusta CC Correctional Center, 18. 18- 21 Esteline E S T A L I N E. You have one minute remaining. Valley Road, and that's in Craigsville, Virginia. C R A I G S V I L L E, Virginia 24430. And thank you for your time.